Hey, it's Vinaya. If you're watching this video, I hope that you've had a chance to check out my previous video where I go through the project I've been building, uh, what I've been working on for a little bit more than a month now. As promised, this video is specifically dedicated to the AI, understanding how the AI models behind my application work. Uh, the truth is, when I originally set off on this project, I was really ambitious. I wanted to redesign the, emer the entire emergency response system by building out my own AI. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized in order to build such a good model, you need a lot of concentrated efforts. You need a lot of really good data, a lot of compute, good engineers. And of course, I didn't have all of this with just me and my MacBook. And so I toned it back a little bit. And if you checked out my previous video, you'll see that a lot of the heavy lifting is done by OpenAI and their APIs. But after utilizing this, because of course it had such better accuracies and such better outputs, I realized that I was interested in understanding what was going on behind this API call, what this black box AI was doing. And so I did that, I pursued that deep dive, and today I'm excited to share with you my results and how all the NLP is working behind my application. Let's dive into it. there's two major players in the NLP space today, BERT and more recently GPT. And both these models actually steal bits and pieces from this main concept known as transformers, which originally stems from a paper from 2017 known as Attention is All You Need. Basically, this model is made up of encoders and decoders, and they're used together for a language translation task in the original paper, but that's why the more recent and more generalized models don't use every part of it, rather they use bits and pieces. Specifically, the encoders have a job of taking some input sequence and turning it into a context vector. And this context vector is just a general representation of the tokens and highlights all their main features. As for the actual decoder, its job is to take this context vector and then produce the next token, generate what the next sequence should be. And it does this by looking at the context vector and its own internal state, looking at what token it is and the previous tokens, and it'll keep producing more tokens, more outputs, until it either produces a stop token or you've reached some maximum length. Today, we're actually gonna break down both the encoder and the decoder because I use both in different parts of my application. I'm specifically using the encoder when I'm detecting duplicate emergencies with BERT and encoder only model. And I'm specifically using the decoder when I'm extracting key details and when I'm generating the next prompt to ask the users. Now, before we dive into this, there's actually a couple of things I wanted to mention. Although certain models are known to be better at completing certain tasks, they're actually very incredibly interchangeable. Depending on the prompt, decoder-only models can actually be fine-tuned to complete tasks that are historically known to be completed by models by the likes of BERT. I'm speaking about this because particularly in my project, I have a section where I'm extracting key details. This is a question-answer task, and this is historically known to be done by BERT. But I found with the right prompt engineering, I was able to actually get better results by GPT. So if anyone out there is watching this video to try and get a better sense of which sort of model to utilize for their project, I just want to put it out there that the models are very interchangeable. They've both been trained on huge chunks of the internet and they're both probably going to give you decently good results, but it's up to you to go and tinker, kind of try out all the different models and see which one is working best for you and your task. Okay, that's enough of this tangent. Let's dive into it now. So today we're going to be following Jay Alomar's illustrations to better understand Transformers. His illustrations are incredible and they make understanding Transformers so much easier. Okay, so in its most simplest form, we basically just have a bunch of encoders and a bunch of decoders. The encoders are creating some contextual representation of the input sequence and our decoders predicting the next token. Specifically, the original paper outlined six encoders and six decoders. This number varies and it's a whole your own architectural choice. Uh, but the whole reason why they do this is in order for each layer to be able to generate more abstract, more generalized representations of the input data. If you've ever worked with CNNs, it's very similar to how CNNs typically first detect edges and then whole shapes until you get to faces and higher level representations. Both the encoder and the decoder are made up of two main components, a self-attention layer and then a feed-for-all neural network. The job of the self-attention layer is to generate attention weights, which basically tells the model which parts of the sentence to focus on. This allows our model to capture dependencies between different values in a text, even if they're farther away from one another, and generate a better representation of the input sequence. 
And finally, our feed for layer, which is also commonly referred to as a fully connected layer, is utilized to transform our self-attention representation into some final hidden state representation. Basically, all the feed for all neural network does is apply a linear transformation followed by a nonlinear activation function in order to model more complex relationships and more complex functions. Congratulations, we have finally zoomed out enough to begin at the first step of transformers, which is tokenization and creating embeddings. Of course, computers can't understand sentences, they only understand numbers, and more specifically, they only understand zeros and ones, but behind the scenes are floating point vectors are being stored as binary anyways behind the scenes, so we don't really have to worry about that. But in terms of the actual tokenization, this can be done in several different ways. The most common ways are word level tokenization, character level tokenization, and subword tokenization. Each have their own pros and cons, but subword tokenization is the most common. Some methods will have larger vocabularies, vocabularies and shorter input sequences, whereas the other ones will be the complete opposite, and we might have shorter vocabularies but longer sequences. The issue with word level tokenization is that if we ever encounter slang or misspellings, we're going to run into errors. And of course, we're going to have really large vocabularies. And the issue with uh, character level tokenization is that now all of a sudden we have to first understand the meaning of individual characters put together before being able to understand the higher level meaning. But of course, both these methods do work. And I actually personally followed Andre Kaparthi in building out a character level tokenizer. And I highly recommend checking out this video and building out an entire GPT from scratch with him. Um, so yeah, it does work, but of course, subword tokenization is better because we have a decently sized vocabulary. And by breaking words into subtokens, we actually are able to get some really good meaning out of it. For example, if we take the words dissociate, discontinue, disembark, all of them will be broken down into their root word and a prefix, for example. And by having that prefix dis, we kind of get that dis, um, that negative connotation applied to it. And so by breaking things down into subwords, we can really easily extract meaning as well. Once the text is broken down into tokens, they're going to be mapped to 512 dimensional uh, vectors, which are input embeddings that are going to be passed throughout the rest of the model. The first layer that this embedding is going to be passed through is the encoder's self-attention layer. And as mentioned earlier, the encoder's self-attention layer's main role is to just generate some general overview of the meaning of the input, which is referred to as the context vector. Most of the times, the words surrounding one particular word will help define its meaning. Take the sentence, Vinaya explained Transformers to me today. She's amazing. The she in the sentence obviously refers to me, and so this goes to show how different words in a sentence can give meaning to some target word, which is exactly what the self-attention layer is doing. I'm going to try and keep this simple for you. If you're interested in reading up on self-attention, definitely look further into it. But basically, our input token embeddings are going to be split into query, key, and value vectors. This is done by taking our input token uh, embedding and multiplying this by learned query, key, and value matrices. We can think of this in the sense of doing an assignment. Pretend you're reading through a textbook with some particular questions in mind. Your questions will become your queries, the information you're looking for. The individual sentences will kind of act like your keys, and the underlying information contained by each sentence will be your values. As you read through the page, you might scan to see how relevant each of the sentences are to the question that you're trying to answer. And depending on how closely they match and how much value they provide to you, you'll actually weigh the value of those sentences more. And that's exactly what we're doing with this concept of query keys and values. The queries and keys are used to identify how much attention we should pay attention uh, to these sentences. And then depending on how important they are and how much information we're gaining from it, we're going to value and weigh the values more. And this is all together the whole concept we use in order to get a general understanding of the page. And it's how our model is able to get a general understanding of the sentence. So that's the overall gist of the self-attention mechanism. We're basically taking our queries, keys, and values, which are calculated by multiplying our input embeddings with some learned uh, matrices. And this can all be done with uh, matrices and vectors because we want everything to be done in parallel. This is actually the major benefit that transformers have over recurrent neural networks. And this is because we're able to compute all of our processes on parallel, meaning it's so much more efficient on today's modern computing systems. And 
Of course, a more faster system means a system that can go through more data and more data just equals a better model. Now we can take the dot product of our queries and our keys in order to get a better representation of each token's relevance on one another. This is then scaled by the square root of the key size uh, because this value is going to be later sent to a softmax function and a softmax function with large scores does not end up well. We end up with the vanished ingredient problem due to the explanations and of course we want to avoid that. Finally, we multiply our value vector with the output of the softmax function in order to basically keep intact the words that we want to focus on and get rid of the irrelevant ones. So this means that we'll basically multiply our irrelevant words by a very small value like 0 0.0001 and the values, the, the words that we want to focus on will be multiplied by a greater weight. Okay, so this is all well and good, but the paper actually describes one more mechanism in order to take our model up another notch. This is through a concept known as multi-headed self-attention. And basically, if we come back to our earlier example of the analogy of the book, you can think of it as reading through a book, paying attention to different parts of the book, and then coming together as one to get a general holistic overview of the book and its meaning. Similarly, with multi-headed self-attention, we can calculate different self-attention scores by using their own query key and value matrices, and then coming together, concatenating them as one, and multiplying it by a final learned weight matrix in order to get a general overview of each of the tokens and their meanings. And we now understand all the main components of the transformer network. We're almost near the end here, but we forgot about one thing. What about position? The entire reason that transformers are better than classical RNNs is because we're able to process everything in parallel by getting rid of positioning. But positioning does matter. Think about the sentence, I hate cats, but I love dogs, and I love cats, but I hate dogs. Both of these sentences have completely opposite meaning, but when put through our model right now, they'll come out with the same embeddings because position matters and we completely disregarded it. In order to capture the order of the tokens, our model adds positional Im information in the form of positional embeddings. These individual embeddings are calculated by taking each token's position in the original sequence, putting that through a mathematical function comprising of sine and cos, and out comes a positional embedding. This positional embedding is added to our original embedding in order to get a general holistic view of each token and its meaning. Finishing up here, there's a couple of small architectural ideas that you might want to keep in mind. Each sublayer or self-attention layer is wrapped around with a residual connection and a layer normalization step. The residual connection is bypassing information directly from one input to the next by using a skip connection. And this is done in order to make sure that no information is being lost. It ensures that the gradients do not vanish and it prevents the vanishing gradient problem, allowing our model to actually learn successfully. And the layer normalization step is just a normalization technique as the name implies. And it ensures that the mean and the variance of our model are close to zero and one respectively, ensuring that there is no unstability going on in our model and ensures that we're able to reach convergence as soon as possible. You now understand everything that you need to know about the BERT model. We now have these embeddings with the meaning of each of our tokens, and we can do any task that we want to do by just fine tuning our model a little bit. Think of it like a kitchen utensil. We now have the base model and we can apply any head that we want in order to complete our particular task. In my case, I utilize the BERT model in order to generate similarity scores uh, between each and every one of my emergencies. We did this by taking our embeddings of the representation of our tokens and mapping it to some vector space. Once these, to uh, these embeddings have been mapped, we can take the cosine of the angle between any embedding and we'll be essentially given the similarity score. So for example, if two embeddings are mapped in our vector space very close together, let's pretend that they're literally on top of one another, the angle of their difference will be zero. And so when we take cos of zero, we'll be given one, meaning they're literally the same meaning. And otherwise, if they're far away in our vector space, then we'll be forced to take the cos of 180, which results in negative one, meaning that these two, um, these two emergencies in my case have no similarity at all. Okay, now all the same components that we talked about in the encoder model 
are used for decoders just with small variances. And I know that a lot of you must be interested in understanding GPT and how GPT works under the hood. So let's look at that real quick as well. The only major difference between our encoder and our decoder is that our decoder can't look at all aspects of the input sequence in order to generate an understanding and meaning of the sequence. And this is because our decoder is actually trying to predict the future. And so it can't look at it. It can only look at itself in the past. In order to do this, before taking the softmax step in the self-attention layer, we mask all the future inputs to have a value of negative infinity so that these future values get no weightage and there's an even probability distribution for all of the previous tokens. Finally, the linear layer is basically taking in this vector that we have as its input and it's going to output some logits. Logits are basically, in our case, votes for which token should be coming next. And this will be a much larger vector for the size of our vocabulary. Let's pretend that in our original first step, we had um, a thousand tokens to choose from. All of a sudden now, the final output from this linear layer will be in a thousand number long vector, which basically comprises of the votes for which token should come next. And then finally, we just take the softmax of this in order to get a probability distribution in terms of which token should be next in terms of its probability. I hope you enjoyed learning about transformers as much as I did. I know that by understanding the model and the architecture, it makes it so much easier for you to write out the code from scratch or fine tune a model on your specific use case. Transformers are honestly incredible. They're here and they're here to stay. All of the cutting edge AI tools today, such as BERT, GPT, DALI, AlphaFold, they're all based off transformers and I know that they can do so much more. Yes, transformers are being used for natural language processing, but they can also be used to model complex tasks like protein folding, and they're even being used in computer vision with vision transformers. Transformers are insane, and even people like Andre Koparthi have been mentioning how they're in awe of this magnificent architecture, and I know that they're going to be doing so much more in the future. That's it about Transformers. I'll stop hyping them up. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. I hope you learned something from this video about Transformers. And I hope that you are also able to see how NLP is able to create a difference in society and make a massive difference with my 9 on 1 dispatch bot. Definitely subscribe to me in order to keep up with my content. I'll be posting a lot more real soon. And I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you and I hope you have a great rest of your day.